Hello, this is Dr. Paul Cottrell, and I'd like to uh, do a critique of a lecture that Niall Ferguson uh, had a couple weeks ago at Princeton. Uh, this is the James Madison lecture, and he talks about, uh, in this lecture, six questions. It's a two-part lecture. It happened over a two-day period. I might do a four part or a two part. I'm not sure yet, but um, I just would like to uh, mention that please, if you, if you like my work um, or even if you don't like my work, please subscribe. Make sure you click the notification bell uh, so you can get informed on my opinion on certain types of, of topics. Um, I have six channels. I have three channel. I have three YouTube channels. So please subscribe to all those channels. The links are in the description of this video and all my videos. I also have Rumble, BitChute, and Brighton. So please subscribe to those as well. The links are in the in the description of this video. Also, I have uh, many um, many videos uh, that, that have been uploaded. So, uh, you know, I have safe harbors and that's the, the bright hand that you rumble. I do the premieres on YouTube, but there's some content that can't remain up on YouTube because of uh, the censorship. In addition, whenever I publish on the larger tank channel, YouTube will bleed me with, you know, a few subscribers each time. This, I am not the only one this is happening to, especially the ones that were covering the crisis in 2020. So uh, please help support uh, the ones that are being censored and make sure that you ask your social media to, to uh, your followers and, and your friends and family to uh, follow my work um, by sharing the, the videos and subscribing. Uh, that way we can get around the censorship and you will be able to be informed as we uh, go through another crisis. There will be another crisis that emerges. Uh, some of it might be geopolitical, some of it could be uh, economic, especially internationally, and uh, some of it may be of biological or origins. So uh, please, uh, what I have to say is really important, and maintaining an audience to be able to, to, to express my concerns and my perspective as things are emerging, I think is uh it's important to maintain that uh that connection to the audience so uh please make sure you subscribe and ask your social media to also subscribe to my work i have products on my store so before we begin i'd like to just plug one 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 type of product as we're going into the spring season in the United States, there's going to be allergies that individuals are going to have because of the pollen. Pollen. So to soothe your your sore throat because of these allergic reactions during the, the spring season, please go to my store and get the structural nano silver drops and lozenges. I have two different types of drops. One drop is in blueberry, in a hundred count. It's a structural nano silver which will neutralize pathogens and soothe your throat. I have it also in honey and lemon, which is a very popular flavor for the audience. It's also in 100 count. The lozenges are larger than the drops. It's in a 21 count. I have it in elderberry zinc, and I also have it in manuka honey in, the, in a 21 count. So please go to the store and get the drops or the lozenges stocked up for your family as we're moving towards the allergy season. So let's begin with the lecture and I'll, I'll interject and give you my, my uh, opinion as we go through. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Robbie, Professor George. It's a great pleasure to be here at Princeton. It's been a long time since I visited this campus. Tomorrow, I'm going to talk a little bit about academic freedom, the subject that Professor George just alluded to. But I think before we talk about the freedom uh, that one is supposed to enjoy uh, at a university, it's best to set it in a broader context. 
And so today I'm going to talk about liberal uh, democracy uh, and its, its discontents. Uh, I'm not going to talk uh, uh, too much, you'll be relieved to hear about uh, American politics uh, or the election of this year. Uh, but of course this year, as The Economist pointed out uh, just the other day, is a big year in the history of uh, democracy. A lot of people will cast a lot of votes uh, this year, indeed, the process has already begun since we had an election in, in Taiwan in January. Uh, and so this is a, a good moment to consider uh, the health, the state of democracy, and in particular, of liberal uh, democracy. Now, I thought we should summon up another Ferguson uh, to provide us uh, with some Scottish Enlightenment orientation, because all good ideas have already uh, been had. They were all had in Scotland uh, in the 18th century, and almost all subsequent ideas are just plagiarized from the Scottish Enlightenment. And if they're not, they're wrong. It's a reasonably good starting point for almost any discussion. And I thought uh, that Adam Ferguson deserved more attention. The other Adam Smith generally uh, gets more. He was an interesting uh, fellow, spoke Gaelic, uh, came from, uh, by my standards, at least the Highlands, uh, had an interesting time in 1745 uh, as chaplain or deputy chaplain rather to the illustrious uh, Black Watch Regiment, succeeded David Hume uh, as librarian to the Faculty of Advocates uh, in 1757, was professor of natural philosophy and later moral philosophy uh, at the University of Edinburgh and wrote uh, during that period his famous essay on the history of civil society. He also, it's uh, worth remembering, played a part in the unsuccessful attempt to negotiate a compromise uh, with the American uh, colonists about whom I will say more later. And like uh, me, he was a fellow of the Royal Society uh, of Edinburgh. Uh, so I'm going to pay a family debt uh, by quoting him in order to frame uh, the discussion that uh, we're going to have. The, the essay on the history of civil society is an extraordinary work, which I recommend unreservedly to you all. In democracy, Ferguson writes, Men must love equality. They must respect the rights of their fellow citizens. They must unite by the common ties of affection to the state. In forming personal pretensions, they must be satisfied with that degree of consideration they can procure by their abilities, fairly measured with those of an opponent. They must labor for the public without hope of profit. They must reject every attempt to create a personal dependence. Candor, force, and elevation of mind, in short, are the props of democracy, and virtue is the principle of conduct required to its preservation. Virtue is the principle of conduct required to the preservation of democracy. How beautiful a preeminence on the side of popular government, and how ardently should mankind wish for the form if it tended to establish the principle or where in every instance a sure indication of its presence. Here, uh, you can detect the characteristic irony of the Scottish Enlightenment. It's one of its more uh, engaging features. But, he writes uh, in section 10 of the first part of the essay, in the disorder of corrupted societies, the scene has been frequently changed from democracy to despotism, and from the last two in its turn to the first from amidst the democracy of corrupt men, and from a scene of lawless confusion, the tyrant ascends a throne with arms reeking in blood. But his abuses or his weaknesses in the station he has gained in their turn awaken and give way to the spirit of mutiny and revenge. Democracy seems to revive in a scene of wild disorder and tumult, but both the extremes are but the transient fits of paroxysm or languor in a distempered state. If men be anywhere arrived at this measure of depravity, there appears no immediate hope of redress. Neither the ascendancy of the multitude nor that of the tyrant will secure the administration of justice. 
like uh, Smith, though I think with a greater clarity, uh, Ferguson understood uh, that justice, that the rule of law was in fact the more important institution, more important uh, than democracy, and uh, that it was quite easy for democracy to founder uh, if virtue was corrupted, and then to lurch between, uh, between demagogy and dictatorship as he describes so well. Don't worry, there won't be too many slides like these. <laughs> I just want to make you all go and read it. <laughs> and you can just shut your eyes and listen to me doing it <laughs> almost exactly in the accent that Adam <laughs> Ferguson would have had. <laughs> so these are the key sections. It's all in part three. Nations have been fortunate in the tenor and in the execution of their laws in proportion as they have admitted every order of the people by representation or otherwise, to an actual share of the legislature. Under establishments of this sort, law is literally a treaty to which the parties concerned have agreed and have given their opinion in settling its terms. The interests to be affected by a law are likewise consulted in making it. Rome and England, under their mixed governments, the one inclining to democracy and the other to monarchy, have proved the great legislators among nations. Under such favorable establishments, known customs, the practice and decisions of courts, as well as positive statutes, acquire the authority of laws, and every proceeding is conducted by some fixed and determinate rule. It is remarkable that in the two examples, the people in both reserved in a manner the office of judgment to themselves, an allusion to the system of jury, trial by jury. We must admire, Ferguson goes on, as the keystone of civil liberty, the statute which forces the secrets of every prison to be revealed, the cause of every commitment to be declared, and the person of the accused to be produced that he may claim his enlargement or his trial within a limited time. But it requires a fabric no less than the whole political constitution of Great Britain, a spirit no less than the refractory and turbulent zeal of this fortunate people to secure its effects. Notice again, Ferguson's point that an institution requires zeal, just as democracy requires virtue, the rule of law requires zeal. It requires... I just want to interject here a little bit. The rule of law in the constitutional republic that the United States has um, is founded on the idea that the branches of government follow the law and that the people respect the law. Now, when you have problems like the judicial branch legislating at the bench, um, you know, in the court system, or you have lawfare that's going on against political candidates, then you have a tainted judicial system. And it's not really following the rule of the law. Um, another case in point, something may be deemed illegal activity or legal activity by the Supreme Court as they hear a certain case. And certain groups of people or even states don't follow what the Supreme Court is saying. So it, this is usually a sign of the cracks in the constitutional republic and the decline of the country and of the society. So uh, another case in point is making sure that through the rule of law, even if one political party doesn't like what the outcome is, um, either in terms of the composition of the legislative branch or the composition of uh, the judges on the bench. It is dangerous to have a particular party trying to write new law in to increase a particular number of seats, for example, at the Supreme Court. Thinking that, well, if we can get a Republican 
or let's say if we can get a a democratic um, a Democrat in the White House and control the Senate um, by the Democratic by the Democratic Party, uh, then you know be able to put more liberal judges on the bench um, instead of let's say nine judges that we have. I mean, maybe they increase it to thirteen. Or twenty one or whatever whatever the number is, then it it will produce a liberal viewpoint of law for decades. Um, and that's kind of like changing the law in such a way where one particular party benefits compared to another particular party. So I also see that as a as a crack in the system, not just by not following current law, but trying to rewrite constitutions in such a way that um, stacks the deck uh, in favor of one particular party or one particular um, spectrum in, poli in, the, in, in the politics. Uh, that's also a sign of a crack in the system where the constitutional republic uh, is declining. So, you know, keep that in mind that we need to hold the rule of law and also hold accountable our representatives in not rewriting laws that aren't in their favor um, and, you know, trying to push something that is politically expedient our framers had the wisdom to realize that in the legislative branch, compared to the white, uh, compared to the executive branch, and compared to the judicial branch, they're they're at different frequencies in terms of when they obtain office. At the Supreme Court level, uh, it's a lifetime appointment, uh, so. It is a lower frequency turnaround. So these judges will be, you know, in their seat, listening to cases uh, for many, many years, usually, right? Um, now for a for the executive branch, the president and vice president, they're up for re-election every four years. For the House of Representatives, it's really, I believe it's every two years, and then for the Senate. It's every six years. I might be wrong on the House of Representatives. It might be four years, but uh, I think it's every two years. So, so um, there are different frequencies, and because there's different frequencies, they you you are able to stabilize a system. If everyone was up for re-election all at the same time for all the same branches of government, government, there, it would create instability. So there's 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 wisdom where the Senate has a a less frequency of turnover uh, compared to the House of Representatives, and um, you know there's wisdom with the with the judicial branch uh, having a lower frequency than let's say the the Senate or the executive branch, the White House. So, so you know, keep that in mind that there, there's, there, there's wisdom that's been written into the Constitution with these different frequencies of branches of government. But when you have a political party, such as, the, let's just say in this case, the Democratic Party wanting to add amendments to the Constitution where it would increase the number of seats uh, in the Supreme Court, um, what that's doing is, is it's it's um, it's stacking the deck and moving the politic to another direct direction, and not really paying attention to the wisdom of the electorate. You know that that our founders of the Constitution, um, when it was ratified, it was a compromise. And it, 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 and there's built in wisdom 
with the understanding that it's the will of the people and these different frequencies between branches of the government that will lead to stability. But by perturbing one of the branches of government and, and, and having it swing too far to one side of the political spectrum uh, makes the system more unstable. And I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about that. And so when we zoom out and look at this from a philosophical point of view, independent on if someone is conservative or liberal, one would have to conclude that it's not in the vein of following law. It's in the vein of writing the law that best benefits you and not the full arc of the, of the history of the country and where the country, country's future is. So. Um, the rule of law is breaking down, you know, as simple as municipality law and in crimes increasing, um, murders increasing, uh, to the point where you have legislation, you're, you have judges legislating at the bench or there's lawfare going against certain political candidates. I don't need to go into details. Everyone understands what I'm talking about here. With the you know the current you know the current race for the presidency, um, so there's lawfare that's that's happening to try to weaken a candidate, and then there's this uh, the rewriting of constitutions just to uh, to uh, you know enshrine a particular a particular extreme perspective, I think this is dangerous. And it's a sign of an unhealthy constitutional republic and not a sign of a vibrant, healthy constitutional republic. A fractury and turbulent zeal of the British to uphold the rule of law. If even the safety of the person and the tenure of property, which may be so well defined in the words of a statute, depend for their preservation on the vigor and jealousy of a free people, and on the degree of consideration which every order of the state maintains for itself, it is still more evident that what we have called the political freedom or the right of the individual to act in his station for himself and the public cannot be made to rest on any other foundation. What I like about my namesake is his insistence on zeal, on virtue, and his constant warning that if a society is corrupted, if it loses that virtue and that zeal, then the institutions of democracy and the institutions of the rule of law won't long survive. This is my theme this afternoon, and it will be my theme. Exactly. We are now in a, in a political polarization in the United States that it's not about the zeal for the rule of law protecting the constitution we're in a um we're in a situation at least in the united states that uh if you don't like something go write a new constitution they're trying to tear it up now you know for the ones that know um you know some of some you know different uh family history um you know my family especially on my father's side goes pretty far back in American history. And uh, it's really important to protect the Constitution. Um, it is a unique document. And we have people that are losing the importance of that document. Um, and if even George Bush Jr. Uh, said post 9-11 that there were certain things he couldn't do because of the Constitution prohibited the executive branch from doing it. So he was famously, um, you know, caught saying that, you know, just, you know, the Constitution is just a piece of paper, you know, forget about it. And that we'll just do, do it anyways. Well, this is the, the, the Constitution is to prevent if we really uphold the Constitution, uh, this is our means to legally fight the national security state. Uh, but you had at the time, post 9-11, uh, George Bush Jr., right? that he wanted to, um, to override the Constitution and found means to try to override it 
in terms of we're in an emergency status or whatever, right? Or try to, you know, have have political, uh, not political, uh, lawyers that would have a particular legal opinion, constitutional legal opinion to meet a political need at the time. Uh, this is dealing with um, Guantanamo and, and, you know, what could, uh, what could the national security state do in terms of trying to uh, secure uh, the United States, you know, and surveil domestic, the domestic um, citizen. So, you know, this now is still a problem in the, in the post 9-11 era, right? Um, but we need to, as a people, we need to hold the constitution because if we don't, we will lose our constitutional republic. There's too many people on the Republican and the Democratic side that if they don't like something, they just say, well, we're going to, you know, we're going to have an amendment. Now, it's hard to pass an amendment, but there's too many times where there is this, this, well, we don't like something, so we're going to create a new amendment. The abortion issue is, is the, 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 er, the latest example of what I'm talking about here in the United States. Um, but that's dangerous. It's dangerous because one, it's not really about the zeal of the rule of law through the Constitution, but it's about political expediency. Morrow. When Adam Ferguson wrote those words, democracy scarcely existed in the world. Certainly by our lights, there were almost no governments based on universal suffrage at the time he wrote his essay. Well, since that time, democracy has grown like topsy. Uh, you can see in this uh, chart here, which is based on data from the varieties of democracy projects, that the number of democracies, uh, we're just counting countries by their uh, political character, has grown remarkably. And contrastingly, the undemocratic regimes uh, have declined. The closed autocracies, which dominated the politics of the Ancien Regime of the 18th century have receded to the point that they are clear minority of countries. So what's striking is uh, that there really are quite a large number of democracies today, around 90 countries out of 178 for which we have reliable data, uh, held relatively recently meaningful free and fair uh, multi-party elections. But the interesting thing is how young most of those democracies are. Only 24 of the world's democracies are more than 60 years old, a significant number to me as I'm about to turn 60. 20 of the world's democracies are less than 90 years old, younger than three of my children. And the Varieties of Democracy database allows you to calculate what the oldest democracies are. Uh, Switzerland, Australia, New Zealand, Iceland, Finland, the United Kingdom, the United States, Canada, and Sweden, although I'm not sure Switzerland really deserves this accolade since it was one of the last countries in the developed world to give women the vote. Pitcairn Islands has the unusual distinction of having given the vote to women first. So the point I want uh, to make is that democracy, uh, in the sense of uh, governments based on universal suffrage, Voting is really quite a novelty. Uh, by the standards of the historians of the Scottish Enlightenment, uh, it's still a new, new thing. Uh, because as you probably inferred from the passages of Ferguson I quoted, uh, the Enlightenment uh, thinkers ranged far and wide and very often extended uh, their analysis back to the time uh, of the ancient Romans. 
I'm going to, in the course of uh, this talk, ask six questions about uh, democracy. And I, I tell you this up front so that you will know when I'm nearing the end. <laughs> I actually rather detest lectures. Um, at Oxford, uh, uh, they're discouraged. Uh, we, we, we never went to lectures as undergraduates. We only went to tutorials. And I think we were right uh, because it's a proven uh, bad way uh, to teach people things. Uh, but I was asked to hold forth and hold forth I shall. <laughs> First, are democracies sliding into illiberalism as predicted by my friend Fareed Zakaria uh, and my colleague and friend Larry Diamond? This is a good question. It's been asked multiple times recently. Actually, Fareed uh, wrote his essay on illiberal democracy quite a long time ago now. It was published in 1997. Uh, uh, but Larry Diamond has recently updated it, uh, and I won't uh, go into detail. Suffice to say that there is a widely held view that the world is in, to quote Larry Diamond, a deep, diffuse and protracted democratic recession. Uh, and if you look at Freedom in the World, which is an annually published survey uh, of the state of uh, not just democracy, but freedom, Quote, global freedom declined for the 17th consecutive year uh, in 2022. That's the most recent uh, uh, report we can quote. Now, if you look here, and I've truncated the chart so that it starts in 1913, uh, what they're talking about is the recent past, really, the events of this century. And you'll notice, uh, if you're an eagle-eyed chart reader, uh, as I am, that there's been something of a decline in the number of liberal democracies and electoral uh, democracies. Uh, and so there is some uh, basis for believing the theory of the democratic recession. To be precise, and I try to be precise, from a high of around 44, uh, the number of liberal democracies has fallen down to 32. By liberal democracies, we mean uh, countries that not only have uh, universal suffrage elections, but hold executive branches to account uh, by a variety of means, the shorthand for which is the rule of law. Uh, though, of course, uh, that embraces uh, freedom of the press and uh, other important institutions that we know constrain uh, elected governments. By contrast, according to this uh, data set, the number of electoral, that is to say, illiberal democracies, places where they hold elections, uh, but there's freedom of the freedom of press is uh, vitiated, uh, the rule of law is compromised, the number of those democracies is, has gone up from 46 to 58, which is pretty much the, the, the scenario predicted by Fareed Zakaria uh, back in the 90s. Um, and the number of uh, autocracies uh, has uh, correspondingly shifted, although electoral uh, autocracies have declined, pure autocracies have gone up in number from 23 uh, to 39. By the way, um, if you're like me, you look at these uh, surveys and you immediately think to yourself, how do they make these calculations? Who decides uh, and how do they award points for liberal uh, as opposed to illiberal democracy? And what's the difference between an electoral autocracy and an electoral uh, democracy? These are valid questions. Are there any political scientists in the room? Political science is an oxymoron, be aware of it. <laughs> If you adjust for population, because up until now I was just counting countries, so Iceland is equal to India. And then this is kind of absurd when you think about it, because we just have this fractal geometry uh, of political geography where we have some giant countries and lots of tiny ones. And that makes calculations like the ones I've shown you so far somewhat preposterous. So let's do it by population. 
if we do that, that is actually rather shocking because then you discover the share of the world's population in liberal democracies has fallen from what was the peak of 17% in the 1990s and 2000s down to just 13% in 2022. Though oddly, the share of electoral illiberal democracies has gone down even further from 37% to 16%. The share in electoral autocracies has gone up and the share in closed autocracies uh, has also uh, risen. So the picture, once you adjust for population, is a good deal worse. And this is, I think, a sobering chart. But I think the reason for this is, is that there's this longer arc. You know, I was, I was mentioning earlier about the rule of law and the importance of the population following the law and also the branches of government following the law and not trying to re rewrite the law in their own benefit. But there's an arc of, of, um, of societies and that arc has different, var different variables and why the arc may be longer or shorter for different democracies. Part of it is education, part of it is the, um, the resources that that society has, the, the, the amount of land, the size of the population, the education of the population, uh, the affinity for morality in the population, um, economic stability. So these variables are really important. These variables are important in terms of making sure that you know that these democracies um, have a, a a vibrancy and will last much longer. But all it seems as though all civilizations have an, an ascent and a, and, and a decline, and eventually they become extinct. Um, you know, classic point is take a look at the Greeks, the, you know, the Greek Empire, um, the Roman Empire. Uh, so, you know, the United States um, and its constitutional, repu the constitutional republic will eventually go extinct. The question is how long? Is it 250 years from now? Will it last another 50 years? We don't know, but there's definitely cracks in the system. And I would say that there are many, many points of, of data to suggest that we're already in the decline. Um, and a big part of that is that there's a lack of affinity to the rule of law, you know, a lack of affinity to the Constitution. And so in the world, um, it's not that surprising that there's more autocracies popping up. A lot depends on what you think of India. Not surprisingly, given its vast uh, population. Now, I, I was delighted to find, as I delved into the various databases, that nobody agrees on whether India is liberal, illiberal, autocratic, democratic. It's <laughs> an extraordinary thing. Uh, regimes, this tells you how subjective it all is, if you hadn't already figured that out. Regimes of the world says India's been an electoral autocracy twice during uh, Indira Gandhi's state of emergency and again since 2017. But the Boix Miller Rosato database continues to classify India as a democracy. The Economist is kinder to Mr. Modi than regimes of the world and it gives the, the modest decline in its democratic score from 7.92 out of 10 you can't really measure with this precision, down to a 7.04. Um, and the, the Economist concludes that we shouldn't be too, quote, prim about judging uh, India. I, I think this is interesting. So you can see uh, with this database, the Varieties of Democracy database, how countries sort of zoom around. Um, and I mean, it's quite remarkable that here too, you see the Modi regime given essentially the same score as the state of emergency under Indira Gandhi. 
gets worse. Um, this is why I became a historian, by the way. It was stuff like this. Uh, so here are all the different uh, data uh, bases that, that measure India's democracy. And, and you can see that they're just all over the place. In some cases, there's been such a decline uh, in the state of Indian democracy that it's almost on the par with British rule, which I think is a little hard on Mr. Modi and the BJP. Uh, in other uh, databases, like the lexical one, there's hardly been any diminution at all. So whether you think there's a democratic recession uh, or not depends on what you think of this. The real question about the, the direction of democracy in the world is where is India going? This is a photograph of uh, the Indian prime minister groundbreaking uh, the temple dedicated to the Hindu god Ram in Ayodhya, which was just finally opened uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I, I asked my Indian friends, what am I to make of this increasing, increasingly explicitly Hindu political culture in a country with such a large Muslim minority? And those of you who know India well will know that you will get very different answers to this question depending on whom you ask. My friends in, in the Delhi intelligentsia, in the journalistic and academic worlds, think that the BJP is a fascist party and that India is on course to fascism. And Mr. Modi's uh, defenders will say the exact opposite and argue that the BJP has been far better for ordinary Indians than any number of governments run by Congress. Talking of the British, <laughs> my second question uh, will strike an American audience as eccentric. How are we to explain the phenomenon of democratic monarchies? Uh, and it's an appropriate question to ask in this week when we learn of King Charles's uh, illness and wish him a speedy recovery. Actually, Adam Ferguson wouldn't have been surprised. That's quite a lot about monarchy in uh, the essay on civil society. Not surprisingly, uh, writing as he was at a time when uh, the whole question of who should be uh, king of uh, England and, and Scotland had been a, a big enough question to cause a near civil war. Uh, Ferguson acknowledges that uh, monarchy is one of the dominant uh, ways in which a country can uh, be organized. He also talks at length about uh, aristocracy. I think Ferguson would be unsurprised to find monarchy still a going concern, but I think he would be surprised if he could join us uh, this evening by the almost complete disappearance of aristocratic systems of government. Uh, a surprising number of democracies are uh, constitutional monarchies today, uh, around 43. Uh, uh, most of them, but not all of them, have a connection to uh, the British uh, Empire, renamed uh, Commonwealth at the time of its dissolution. But there are also significant vestiges of, of European monarchy uh, in Belgium, Denmark, the Netherlands, Norway, Spain, Sweden, there are all these funny little places like Luxembourg, Andorra, Liechtenstein, Monaco. It's worth remembering that the Republic did not become the dominant form, though you might have expected it to in, say, the 1790s. Actually, one of the great failures uh, of 20th century history is the failure uh, of republics that were created in periods of revolution to stabilize as democracies. Uh, an enormous number of republics founded in the revolutionary periods of the 20th century failed to remain democratic for more than a few years. Uh, this was true in Europe and Eastern Europe. It's true in the Middle East, too. Uh, so we have monarchies in the Middle East and elsewhere, but very few of those are democratic. And that's why my favorite... Before we go... 
continuing on that lecture, uh, let me do a product placement. Uh, this is TNA. Please go to my store, the-studio-reconvict.com and get the structural nanosilver gel that I have. This will neutralize pathogens. It will also help with skincare. So the way to help with neutralized pathogens is put it on your hands, put it around your mouth, around your nose, around your eyes, around your ears, neutralize pathogens, lightly coat your nostrils. And, um, you know, that's part of the protocol to, you know, stay healthy, let's say, you know, during the cold season or whatever. But um, you can also apply it on cuts, abrasions, minor burns, and it'll help to heal that area. Uh, in addition, you can apply it on your skin at night, uh, leave it overnight, and then exfoliate in the morning. Do that, you know, several times, several times uh, throughout the week, and you'll notice that you're going to have improved skin. Uh, it's part of a larger um, um, skincare protocol that I have, but uh, the bare bones would be to just apply it on your skin, leave it on your skin overnight. Uh, you'll notice that your skin will be clearer, but uh, also it, it helps to tighten the skin, especially when you put it on your face. So uh, please uh, go to the store and get the this structural nano silver gel. This is a dual use product, which I am you know a big fan of because you know things are costly today. And uh, people need to buy products that have dual purpose to get more bang for their buck. In addition, please go to my store and get the probiotic that I have. I have it. This one's in powder. This You put the, the powder, uh, let's say, in water, or you can mix it with your food. I normally mix it with hummus. You can put it in a smoothie. Take it every day. There's a little scooper in here. So you take a, one little scooper each day, and it'll help to improve your gut biome. Why is that important? By having the proper gut biome, you're going to have better absorption. You're going to have better metabolism uh, and a better communication between your gut and your liver. So please go to the store and get the probiotic. Lastly, I have Max 35. I take this every day. What you do is, is that you take you take it, um, you take about a teaspoon of it. Every day, you swish it in your mouth, and you gargle with it, and then swallow. If you're not feeling well, take a tablespoon or two a day. Um, this, this has structural nanosilver in it. This is going to neutralize pathogens. And by doing that on a regular basis, you're reducing the chances of uh, you know, coming in contact with, with something that may make you more sick. Again, if you do get sick, Take a tablespoon or two a day. But um, let me add one more product to it. So the idea of the MAX-35 is it's part of an anti-aging protocol. It's one pillar. The other two pillars is a strong antioxidant, like C60, and then bringing down inflammation uh, with turmeric and ashwagandha. And ashwagandha also controls blood glucose levels. But uh, you also want to boost your immune system. So you're neutralizing pathogens and you want to boost your immune system. I have several products that, that will help boost up your immune system. And uh, one of those is magnesium and zinc. So take this every day. If you're not feeling well, take a double dose of it. So let's uh, thank, thank, I appreciate you uh, purchasing my products um, and the ones that uh, have been following the protocol, you know, Thank you for listening and paying attention to what I do. I, you know, I, I have a, I follow the protocol that I tell everybody to, to, to follow. Um, and you can tweak it in a certain way based on your needs. But um, the, the, the core of the protocol is neutralize pathogens with structural nano silver gels and liquids. Take C60 as an antioxidant, strong antioxidant, and to bring down that inflammatory response by taking turmeric and ashwagandha. But then you add stuff like magnesium and zinc to help to boost uh, other components of the immune system. A song in the musical Hamilton is, is you'll be back. Because I think in the end you will. 
<laughs> you will, because it's so very, very difficult to run a republic. And most republics, as the Enlightenment thinkers and the Renaissance thinkers and the classical thinkers understood, and most republics ultimately do succumb to the demagogue and the dictator. And it's hard to avoid. I'm sorry to tell you this, but it is, I think, a very, very striking feature of history. And if the United States beats that particular trend, it will have beaten Western political philosophy. Because Western political philosophy consistently predicts that the republic will not long survive, that democratic republics are inherently unstable. Question three of six, remember? <laughs> can democracies unite effectively against the forces of autocracy? Of course they can, of course they can. Less than a year ago, President Biden went to Kiev courageously. A few presidents have gone to countries at war in the way that he did. And he said, and I quote, Putin thought Ukraine was weak and the West was divided. I said to you at the beginning, he's counting on us not sticking together. He was counting on the inability to keep NATO united. He was counting on us not to be able to bring in others on the side of Ukraine. You remind us, he told President Zelensky, that freedom is priceless. It's worth fighting for, for as long as it takes. And that's how long we're going to be with you, Mr. President, for as long as it takes. Well, this was uh, funding of Ukraine a year ago. And the United States was by far the dominant contributor to the Ukrainian war effort. And this is where we were the last time the Ukraine support tracker uh, was uh, published with the Europeans having overtaken the United States. And I leave it to your imagination what this chart will look like in a couple of months time. Because as things stand, the probability is falling rapidly that the United States will continue to support the Ukrainian war effort in 2024. Last year, many people worried that if Donald Trump were re-elected, the US would cut off its funding to Ukraine. And it's happened 10 months before uh, the presidential election. Uh, a friend of mine is uh, embedded with Ukrainian troops uh, at the moment, at the front line, and he emailed me to say that the disaffection and disillusionment amongst ordinary Ukrainian soldiers at the uh, uh, the congressional cutoff uh, of aid to Ukraine is a source of a significant loss of morale. Polling is interesting on this. Uh, Lord Ashcroft's polling probably has the greatest precision. Uh, this is polling of of US uh, voters by party. And, and you can see uh, that around 30% uh, of Republicans, when this poll was conducted, which was late last year, think the US is doing too much. Uh, uh, and 46%, uh, which is about the right number across all party affiliations, think it's doing about the right amount, which of course it isn't and wasn't. Uh, certainly not if the goal was for Ukraine to win the war, as opposed to just not lose it. Uh, and the polling, uh, I think, is, is quite clear here. Uh, something like 39% uh, say the United States is doing too much with respect to the military, as opposed to the humanitarian situation. Ask, does the US have an interest uh, in Ukraine? Uh, 30% of Republican voters say the Ukraine-Russia conflict has nothing to do with the US and we should not be intervening uh, in any way. The striking thing to me is that uh, that is not massively out of alignment with the average for all voters. So that answers that question. And I suppose it leads naturally into my fourth question. Is there a political economy of democratic self-destruction via excessive debt and or inflation? Those of you uh, as old as I am will recollect that this was a fairly common hypothesis of conservative thinkers in the 1970s when inflation uh, was in double digits in most developed countries. 
I think it's still a question worth asking today, though inflation has not reached 1970s levels. Ever since I began writing about the United States, and I began writing about it more than 20 years ago, there has been a more or less unsustainable fiscal policy at the federal level. And one can see that it's not unique to the United States because there are countries, uh, including the United Kingdom, uh, including France, uh, Italy, and Japan, that have even higher levels of uh, public debt in relation to gross domestic product than the United States does. The inflation problem has not recurred in the way that it, it uh, did in the 1970s, or at least perhaps I should say not yet, uh, because it's worth bearing in mind that uh, what happened in the last few years also happened in the early 1970s. And it, I think, is still premature to declare the uh, inflation problem over, though economists itch to do that. But at any event, the significance of these fiscal and monetary data are political as much as they are economic. It is already clear, and this relates to my last question, it was already clear that uh, the United States is spending uh, more on interest payments uh, than on national security at this point. I'm going to make this probably a four-part series, and I'll stop here. Please go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com, and get the health products that I have, also the eBooks, and uh, I have this new product out there. It's what is called the pulmonology module. And for $50, you get access to 22 lectures. You, you are able to download PDF files for each of the lectures and see a video that accompanies each of the uh, concepts, these 22 concepts in pulmonology, uh, only for $50. So you get a lot of content. The reason to get this particular module is to um, you know learn how the human body works in terms of the pulmonary system, uh, understand different types of diseases like COPD and asthma, uh, tuberculosis, sarcoidosis, um, uh, learn about uh, embryology of the, the lung system, the anatomy of the lung system, uh, the physiology, the pathophysiology. So you learn a lot for only $50. So uh, please go to my store and purchase the pulmonology module. It's a popular item. Uh, and uh, you're challenging your mind. You learn about medicine and you're reducing that power imbalance between your physician and yourself. And by doing that, you are going to be uh, going into that, into, that, um, into that doctor's office appointment uh, with more knowledge and you will be able to be more discerning um, and, and be in more charge of your, your healthcare as you're discussing your particular needs with your physician. So please go to the store, the dash studio dash .com, get the health supplements and get medical knowledge. All right. You can, you can learn a lot in a very short amount of time by purchasing that module. Thank you for listening and have a nice day.